I took my seat on the plane heading home and watched out the window as the plane rose into the sky. Finally, after 30 years, I was coming home for good. I felt I had to do this for me and my wife, Lisa. I pulled out the Zippo lighter I had carried with me all these years, a gift from my wife that read, To my beloved husband, Alan. Congratulations, Marine. That's me, by the way, Alan Roberts. Machine Gunnery Sergeant Alan Roberts, or Machine Gun Rob, for those I've decided to let get close to me over the years. After today, another nickname will be added to this one, Retired. I spent over 30 years in a military uniform that was now adorned with ribbons and badges that meant nothing to anyone but me. A little over 10 of those years I spent in the reserves. I could literally say I'd been there, done that, gotten all the shirts. I was already in shape when Lisa and I got married so long ago. I literally met her on the side of the road one day after work. I was working as a mechanic at a large car dealership in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and was driving home when I saw her car on the side of the road. Her hood was up and I could see steam rising from her engine. I did what people often do when they see people in need. I stopped and offered to help. It didn't hurt that she was nice to look at. One look and I realized what the problem was. Her fan belt was torn. It was an easy fix. I ran to an auto parts store nearby and came back with a belt and coolant to replace what she had lost. I had her car running in no time. Thank you so much, she said. I need to get back to Spokane and I thought I'd never make it. Is there anything I can do to thank you? Just come home safely, I said. No, please let me repay you, she begged. How about I buy you dinner? Do you like Red Lobster? What the hell, I thought. I love Red Lobster, I said. She smiled and wrote down her name and number on a piece of paper. Okay, she said. How about Friday at 7 p.m.? Sounds good, I said. We met that Friday night and had been together ever since. After eight months of dating, I popped the question and we got married. That was in 1987, and I've been a happy man ever since. She moved to my home in northern Idaho, although that added over 30 miles to her commute. She worked as a teacher at an elementary school in the Spokane Valley, just across the state line. We debated buying something closer to her work, but I liked my house and especially liked the fact that it was vacant and situated on five acres of wooded land just off Interstate 95 north of Coeur d'Alene. The house had been built by my parents many years ago, and they had left it to me in their will along with a nice inheritance. I hoped to one day pass the house on to one of my children. Lisa knew that because I was in the reserves, I had to go away for a weekend a month and two weeks each year for training. She never complained, and the checks, however small, were usually deposited in my IRA. Our first child, Renee, was born about a year and a half after we were married. In 1990, a brutal dictator named Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and my unit was called to active duty. We returned a little over a year later to a warm welcome, and a year after that, our son Carl was born. Then September 11th happened, and all of our lives changed. I was given the opportunity to go into active duty, and I accepted. From that point on, we moved back and forth between Camp Pendleton, California, and Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Lisa was certified to teach in both states, so she had a job wherever we went. I ended up spending three tours of duty in Iraq and three more in Afghanistan, a total of just over six years. I was also sent to Okinawa four times for a year. Each time, Lisa and the kids came back to our home in Idaho, and she ended up working at the same school in Spokane Valley. She never complained, God bless her soul. But I knew it was weighing on her and the kids, and I felt bad. Ten missed anniversaries, ten missed birthdays, and Christmas is not good for any family. When it came to this tour, I promised her it would be her last. Now, in my 56 years, I felt that running around in the hot desert dodging bullets was a game for younger men. I had done my duty, and it was time to go home. You might think that after 30 years of service or more, I should have retired at a much higher rank, and you would be right. In some respects, I was a typical Marine. I didn't chase wild women but I did like to drink with my comrades, and my adherence to the concept of Semper Fidelis, always faithful, got me into trouble more than once when I stood up for my comrades with my physical strength and willingness to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. As a result, I lost two promotions. But I didn't complain or whine. Heck, I loved being a machine gunnery sergeant. Gunny was the man everyone went to for advice or tactics. I took damn good care of my Marines, officers and enlisted alike, and they respected me for it. That alone meant more to me than all the medals and ribbons on my chest. I remembered my retirement party that the guys had thrown. 
We had a good time swapping sea stories and telling salty anecdotes. Lieutenant Colonel Reston, our battalion commander, stopped by to wish me well. I had known him for a long time. He was one of the officers who had tied me up years ago. I held no grudge against him, and we became good friends. He shook my hand after presenting me with a commendation for my service. The Corps won't be the same without you, Gunny, he said, smiling. I smiled back. Thank you for saying that, Colonel, I said. But I think he's in good hands. One of the soldiers, Lance Corporal Dawson, a big black guy from Georgia, walked over with his buddies and handed me something wrapped in brown paper. Just something to remember us by, Gunny Rob, he said, smiling. I pulled the paper off and smiled when I saw what was inside. It was a hand-carved wooden hand with an extended middle finger. It reminded me of the many times I had jokingly put my hand on someone's arm, which I often did. The Marines who knew me, even the officers, understood that I was just that way and never took offense. I turned the carved figure over and saw that he had carved the Marine Corps emblem on the back of his hand, as well as our unit designation. Did you do that yourself, Dawson? I asked. He smiled and nodded his head. Sure did, Gunny, he said, glowing with pride. Hell of a job, I said. I'll treasure it for the rest of my life. Thanks. We shook hands and the other Marines around us shouted and applauded. I looked over at Staff Sergeant Joel Henson, the young man who had taken my place as company machine gunner. You take damn good care of these Marines, Joel, I told him as we shook hands. I will, Gunny, I promise, he replied, smiling. Good. Because if you don't, I'll come back and kick your ass, I said, laughing. That set off another round of laughter and hooting. Henson is a good man, Gunny Rob, said Captain Michaels, our company commander. Of course, no one can replace you. Take care of yourself, Gunny. It's been an honor to serve with you. We shook hands and said our goodbyes. Then the driver came over to let me know that all my gear was loaded and ready to go to the airport. I felt the plane begin to descend and my consciousness came back to the present. I looked down and saw the city of Spokane, Washington come into view. I could make out the river and the waterfall, and I could clearly see Riverfront Park and the iconic pavilion built for Expo 74. I took Lisa and the kids there many times to enjoy the summer sunshine. Soon the plane landed and we all got off. I grabbed my sea bag and bag of clothes and headed for the exit, hoping to see Lisa. I sent her an email and a message with the flight information so she would know when to pick me up. She usually arrived a few hours before my plane landed in case I arrived early. But she wasn't there. That was weird, I thought, and texted her again. At the airport. Where's are you? Getting no response, I called her cell phone, but the message went straight to voicemail. I started to worry and called home, but got an answering machine. God, I said quietly, please let her be safe. I called her parents, but they said they hadn't heard from her either. Do you need us to pick you up? Her mother asked. Not yet, I said. Maybe she's stuck in traffic. I'll wait a while and call you if I can't find another hitchhiker. There's no point in you driving this far and then also to Athol. But if you hear from her, please ask her to call me. I will, Alan, she said and hung up. My thoughts were interrupted by a man's voice. Do you need a ride, Gunny? The man asked. I looked over and saw a tall, well-built man in khaki loading a suitcase into a white SUV. Well, I thought my wife was already here, I said. Where are you headed? He asked. To Idaho, between Athol and Bayview, off Highway 95, I told him. No problem, he said. I'm going right there. I'd be happy to give you a ride. What the hell, I thought. Sure beats paying for a cab. Thanks, I said. Appreciate it. Please let me at least pay for your gas. He shook his head. No, don't worry about it, he said. The company credit card will take care of that. Go ahead and load up. I threw my sea bag and a duffel bag of clothes into the Jeep and climbed in. Home on vacation, he asked, getting in the car. Home for good, I replied. 30 days terminal vacation and then I officially retire in 30 years. That's a long time, he said. By the way, my name is John Sykes, he added, extending his hand. Alan Roberts, I said, shaking his hand. Where do you come from? he asked. 
The unit just got back from Afghanistan, flew in from Camp Lejeune, I told him. So you've had quite a long day, he said. You can say that again, I said. I pulled out my phone and sent Lisa another text. Got a ride, no worries. TC is home. So what are your plans? He asked as we pulled into the driveway. Not much, I replied. Fishing, hunting, chasing the wife around the bedroom, you know. He chuckled. Yeah, I know, he said. Spent 25 years in the army. Retired with the rank of lieutenant colonel. Believe me, retirement isn't all it's cracked up to be. What do you do now? I asked. I run a camp for men in northern Idaho, he said. Really? I asked. I've lived in Idaho all my life, but I've never known a camp for men. When did it come into existence? It's been around for about 10 years, he said. No offense, but I'll be very surprised if you've heard of it. We put it in Idaho on purpose to keep it out of sight. What kind of camp is it? Asked I. It's a camp designed to help men deal with certain personal situations, he said. Oh? I asked. What kind of situations? Well, let me put it this way, he said. You've obviously seen combat. Have soldiers or Marines ever received a Dear John letter from home? Not once, I said. Then you know what the news that his wife is cheating on him does to a man, he said. Too well, I said. We help men deal with problems like that, he said. The only difference is that most of them have never had military training like you and me. Hell, a lot of the men who come to my camp are afraid of their own shadows. Damn, I said. So how do you help them? Well, we strengthen them physically, he said. Then we work on their mental and emotional state and provide all the legal services we can so they can deal with whatever they're facing. That sounds like a lot, I said. How long do they stay at your camp? The regular course lasts three months, he said. It's very intensive, about the same as recruit training. Sounds like it, I said. Ever spend any time as a drill instructor? He asked. Yes, I replied. I served successfully at Paris Island, South Carolina. I enlisted there as a sergeant and was promoted to the rank of staff sergeant at the end of my service. So you know the methods we use, he said. I was impressed with what the man was saying and I was curious to see this camp. I've actually been given the green light to bring in a new senior instructor to supervise the other instructors, welcome new students, oversee the curriculum and all that. Does that sound interesting? I have to admit it does, I said. Somehow I feel like we met for a reason. He smiled. You're very perceptive, Alan, he said. I'm not going to lie to you. You're too good a man for that. The company has had its eye on you for a long time. On me? I asked. Why on me? Well, for starters, you're a local resident, a combat veteran with no stellar past, save for a few bar scuffles, he said with a smile. Silver Star, Bronze Star, Meritorious Service Award, Four Purple Hearts, Combat Action Ribbon, Navy Achievement Medal, Navy Achievement Medal, Navy Meritorious Service Medal, Navy Marine Corps Medal, Good Conduct Medal, despite the bar fights. You're exactly what our program needs. Heck, Gunny, you're exactly what our students need. And you're saying your company has its eye on me? I asked, concerned. Yes, he replied. We were just waiting for you to apply for retirement. This job couldn't be better suited for someone like you. The pay and benefits are much better than the core, and you'll report only to me. Sounds interesting, I said. But there's one but in your application. He nodded his head. And you'd be right, he said, handing me a manila envelope lying on the seat beside him. There's only one problem you need to solve first. Go ahead and take a look. I opened the folder and saw a neatly typed report detailing the activities of one Lisa Roberts, my wife, and a man named Elroy McEnroe, the principal of the school where she works. My heart clenched as I read the report. According to it, Lisa had been sexually involved with this man for over 20 years, often meeting with him while I was away from home. I saw the DVD in the envelope and was horrified to see what was stored there. Where did you get this? I asked. 
I'm not going to insult your intelligence, Alan, he said. The company decided to vet you after I expressed interest in hiring you for the position. Part of that vetting included your family life, for obvious reasons. I take it you didn't know that was going on. I shook my head, amazed at what appeared before me. No, I didn't know, I said. How do you know this has been going on for 25 years? The investigators we use are top-notch, he said. And they have the latest surveillance equipment. If something can be found, they find it. They determined that from conversations between your wife and Mr. McEnroe. Obviously, your wife has done her best to keep it from you all these years. That explained all the time she spent there while I was abroad. It also meant that half of the last 20 years she'd spent with Elroy. Damn! A horrible thought suddenly struck me. What about the kids? I asked. That's the only good news in all this, he said. They're both yours? How do you know that? I asked. Like I said, our investigators are the best, he said. They took DNA samples from both of your children and compared them to the DNA in the military file on you. It all matched. I have a feeling you knew she wasn't coming to meet me at the airport, I said. He nodded his head. That's right, he said. According to the investigators, they meet often after school, but one day a week she takes him to your house where they do a case. Then she drives him back, where he picks up his car and drives home. They have kept this routine since you have been gone. And tonight they usually drive to your place. Shit, I said. That's 70 miles round trip just for a piece of ass. How could she do that, I asked. John shrugged. It happens, you know, he said. Long business trips, time away from home and family. You come back from war changed in ways you don't even realize. That can put a strain on the best marriage. The question is, what are you going to do about it? If all this is true, I have no choice but to divorce her, I said. John nodded his head approvingly. Yeah, I agree, he said. What about him? Good question, I said. I'd like to skin him alive, but I don't want to go to jail. I'll figure something out. All the information you need is in the report, John said. He's married. He and his wife have two kids. Who, by the way, doesn't know about his affair with Lisa? Do you swear that this information is correct? I asked. He nodded his head. Absolutely, he said. If I had any doubt at all, I wouldn't have shown it to you. I'm really sorry, Gunny. You're a good man and you don't deserve this. Who does deserve it? I asked. Well said, John said. We reached the turnoff to my house and John turned onto a narrow paved road. A few minutes later, we pulled up to my driveway and turned in. You're really out in the middle of nowhere, he said, as he drove down the driveway and stopped in front of my house. Nice place you have here, he said. Thanks, I replied. My parents built this place with their bare hands. I was hoping Lisa and I could live here in retirement. I guess it'll just be me here at least for now. John turned to look at me. Listen, Alan, he said, holding out a business card to me. Call me when you can and come to camp. We can talk about it if you want. We even have counselors to help you through it if you feel the need. I'll introduce you to the guys, give you a tour of the nickel, and tell you a little more about what we do. I think this will help you make up your mind. Feel free to wear your uniform if you want. I'm serious about this job, but you need to take care of this one he added, pointing to a manila envelope. I nodded my head in understanding. Thanks, John, I said. For the trip, for the offer, for everything. I'll take care of it, I promise you. I'll be in touch. We shook hands and I got out of the SUV, grabbing my sea bag and bag of clothes. He turned around and drove off, and I headed for the front door. I carried my things into the bedroom and put everything in its place, still in shock at what John had said. I noticed that everything was neat as a pin, just the way Lisa always liked it. She may be a cheating whore, I thought, but at least her house is clean. After putting everything in its place, I changed into my uniform, wearing jeans and a t-shirt. I grabbed my folder and went downstairs. I needed to see what else was in that report. I pulled out the DVD and put it in the player. I turned on the TV and started the DVD. I saw Lisa and Elroy in a motel-like room. So when are you going to dump him? he asked. I don't know. Probably not until he retires, she replied. 
If you play your cards right, you could get half of his retirement checks and most of his savings in 401k, Elroy said. That was her plan. Good thing I have the prenup she signed when we first got married. Dad had the form ready for me when he died. All I had to do was put her name on it. His biggest concern was the house and the inheritance they left me. I had heard enough and pulled out the phone book. It wasn't too late, so I called and made an appointment with a family law attorney for the next morning. Going upstairs, I gathered some of her things and set the bags by the door. Screw her, I thought. If she wants to leave, I'll let her go. Afterward, I spent some time on the couch, reflecting on my life with Lisa. As far as I knew, things were fine between us. Sure, we had the same problems that every married couple has, but we always worked them out. I always thought that if she was going to cheat on me, it would only be with someone much bigger than myself. But I couldn't imagine that she would settle for a marshmallow man. I even laughed out loud when I thought about it. However, in all the years we'd been together, I'd never once guessed that our lovemaking was causing her physical pain. She had never told me about it. What surprised and impressed me was that she was always trim, even after our children were born. I made my way to my office and opened the cabinet where I kept my indoor tools. There, on a shelf, was an unopened package of duct tape. There were two rolls in the package, and while I was looking at them, an idea popped into my head. I took the duct tape and the package of zip ties and closed the cabinet. I walked over to the gun cabinet, opened it, and pulled out a .45 caliber pistol. After making sure it was empty, I went back to the dining room. I spread everything out on the table, made a sandwich, grabbed a beer, and sat at the table waiting for them to arrive. It was starting to get dark when I heard a car pull into the garage. A couple minutes later, I heard the two of them giggling and talking as Lisa opened the door. Neither of them saw me sitting at the table until they entered the main part of the house. Lisa's eyes widened when she saw me at the table. Alan, she exclaimed. When did you get here? Didn't you get my emails and messages? I asked. Sorry, my phone battery died, she said. Things aren't what they seem, Alan, trust me. Really? I asked. You mean it's not you and Elroy getting ready to have fun in our bed? Alan motioned toward me and I raised my gun. He stopped in place, his eyes widening and his face even whiter than it was. There were no bullets in the gun, hell, the magazine didn't even fit in the pistol grip, but they didn't know that. Oh God, he screamed. Please don't do this. I noticed a wet spot in the crotch of his pants and smiled. The bastard had wet himself. Shut up, asshole, I said. You think you can entertain another man's wife for over 20 years and get away with it? I don't think so. Stand against the tree, I told him. Put your back against it. Hands behind your back. I looked at Lisa. Tie him to the tree, I ordered. All I want to see are his eyes and nose. Move. She took the first roll and began gently applying it to his skin. Hurry the hell up. Run. She started running around the tree, dispensing tape as she went. When the first roll was used up, I tossed her the second and ordered her to keep going. By the time she was done, Elroy was attached to the tree in a cocoon of duct tape. Only his eyes and nose were visible. He was looking back and forth fearfully. I walked over to him and made sure he couldn't move. Then I looked into his eyes, smiled, and pulled out my cell phone. I dialed his home number, which I had thanks to the report John had given me. McEnroe residence, Judy speaking, said a female voice on the other end. Mrs. McEnroe, my name is Alan Roberts, I said. Is your husband Elroy here? No, he has a meeting with the teachers at his school, she replied. May I take a message and ask him to call you back? That won't be necessary, Mrs. McEnroe, but thank you anyway, I said. I apologize for the deception, but the truth is that your husband is at my house with my wife, and I think you should come and get him. I saw Elroy's eyes grow even wider under the tape. What is he doing in your house with your wife? asked Judy. Well, they were going to have sex, but they had a change of plans, I said. What? yelled Judy. Are you sure about that? Is this some kind of sick joke? No, ma'am, I said. It's not a joke. They've been having an affair for over 20 years. That bastard, she shouted. I'm going to kick that bastard's ass. God damn it, I'll come and get him. 
Where are you located? Idaho, east of Athol on Highway 95, I said. I'll send you directions. Thank you, Mr. Roberts, she said. I'll be there as soon as I can. After we finished talking, I texted her directions to my house, then looked at Elroy, who was even more scared than before. I'm going to have a little talk with my wife right now, if you don't mind, I told him. Don't go anywhere, do you hear me? He tried to shake his head, but the tape wouldn't let him. I gestured for Lisa to go inside. She stepped aside and I followed her. When we got into the house, I motioned for her to sit on the couch and held the remote for the TV and DVD player. How long does this shit last? I asked. And before you say anything, remember that I know a lot more than you think. It's been going on for a while, she said quietly. For a while? I asked. What, a month? A year? Ten years? Twenty years? Longer? Longer, she said, lowering her face. Longer, I said, repeating her answer. I see. When did it start? Around 1995, she said. We worked together for years and never did anything while you were home. We only got together when you were gone. Including all those times I was sent overseas? I asked. She nodded her head. Yes, she said. I'm sorry. I never meant to hurt you. You weren't supposed to find out about it. So while I was fighting terrorists and getting shot in the ass, you were here, having fun with this piece of shit in our bed? I asked. She started crying. Stop pouring water, I told her. Answer the damn question. She wiped her eyes and nodded her head. Yes, she said. Please. We can get past this. Can't you give me another chance? Get through this? I asked. Are you kidding me? You think I should just turn a blind eye to your cheating? Give me one good reason why I shouldn't just kick your ass to the curb right now. It shouldn't concern us, she said. And I don't want a divorce. I knew she was lying, since I'd heard what she'd said to Elroy. It's too late for that, bitch, I said. I'm seeing a lawyer tomorrow. She looked at me defiantly. You don't want to do that, she said. Elroy said if you try to divorce me, I can get half your pension, the house, and everything else. I laughed and held out the prenup. There's just one problem, I said. Remember the prenup you signed all those years ago? Guess what? It's still valid and it's ironclad. You don't get a damn thing if I can help it. The house is all mine, remember? My parents willed it to me. And the prenup clearly states what happens in the event of infidelity. Don't worry, I'll follow it to the letter. You'll get 40% of our joint savings, but no support. And I get to keep all of my retirement contributions. I'll argue with you, she said. I figured you'd say something like that, I said pointing the remote at the TV. I pressed play, and a video of her having fun with Elroy popped up on the screen. Her face went white and she covered her mouth with her hand. Oh my God, she gasped. How did you get this? Please turn it off. I shook my head. It doesn't matter how I got it, I said. What matters is what your school board will do when they get a copy of this. She looked at me, shocked. I'm going to lose my job, she said. And so will Elroy. Please, no, don't do this. So you'll sign the papers when you get them? I asked. Defeated, she nodded her head. I turned up the volume on the video and fast-forwarded to the part where she complained that I was too big for her. Can you explain that to me? I asked. All these years we've been together and you've never complained once. Why didn't you say anything? I didn't want to hurt your feelings, she said. I've always been a little down. I liked it at first and you always turned me on, but after a while it started to hurt. And that's why you started making excuses not to have sex with me? I asked. She nodded her head. Yes, she said. I'm really sorry. Yeah, that's what you said, I told her. I grabbed her purse and pulled out her keys. I pulled out her house keys then pulled out her wallet. I took out her ATM and general credit card. I saw her STCU card and left it in her wallet. I knew she had an account at the Spokane Teachers Credit Union, 
and I knew she regularly contributed 10% of her paycheck to that account. I figured if she needed money, she could use that account. I tossed her purse back on the couch. I guess I should probably pack up and leave, she said quietly. Not now, I told her. You still have some explaining to do. You need to tell your parents and our children about what you did so they know why we're divorcing. Please don't make me do this, she begged, crying. Why, I asked. You've had no problem cheating on me for two decades. Surely you're not ashamed of what you did. They'll hate me, I know it, she cried. That's too bad, I said, picking up the phone. I was about to call her parents, but I saw the glow of headlights pulling out into the driveway. I figured it was Judy coming to get her husband. Ah, I see Judy is here. You can start by explaining to her why you entertained her husband. A moment later, there was a knock on the door. Opening it, I saw a rather well-fed woman who looked a little younger than me. She looked quite attractive and was wearing her ripped jeans perfectly tight. I couldn't help but notice that she was looking at me even more than I was looking at her. Yes, I asked. Are you Alan Roberts? She asked, slanting her eyes to my crotch. Yes, and you must be Judy McEnroe, I said. For the moment, yes, she said. Please come in, I said as I opened the door. So where is that nasty piece of shit hiding? She asked. I smiled when she said that. I like this woman immediately. He's a little tied up right now, I said. He's not going anywhere, I assure you. Judy looked at Lisa, and her face reddened with rage. So it's you, bitch, having fun with my soon-to-be ex-husband, she said. Her eyes went wide as she recognized my wife. Oh my God, it's you. Lisa Conroy. I should have known. Please stop, Lisa shouted. Shut up, you goddamn whore, Judy wailed. I have to kick your ass by the middle of next week. How can you do that? You're married to this gorgeous piece of man meat and you're cheating on him with a Pillsbury Doughboy? Judy stopped to look at me. Where is that nasty bastard? She asked. I'll take you to him, I said. Wait. I went to my office and opened the cabinet that held the duct tape. I quickly found what I was looking for, a box cutting knife, a bottle of 90% isopropyl alcohol, and a fairly clean rag that used to be a t-shirt. I went back to the front room and invited Judy to follow me. We went outside and I pointed to the tree where I had secured Elroy. Judy burst into laughter when she saw that he was wrapped in duct tape. Elroy wasn't too happy to see his wife, and I could see the terror in his eyes. I like your style, Alan, she said. It's going to take forever to rid him of all this. I shook my head and set the spork and rag on the ground. No, it won't take, I said. She held up her hand. Wait a second, she said. She walked over to him and looked him in the eye for a second. You're a damn asshole, she said, taking off the rings. She threw the rings on the ground. You haven't touched me in months and now I know why. I decided this was the woman I didn't want to piss off. I pulled out a box cutter and cut the band. Then I stepped back and looked at Lisa. Once free of the tape, Elroy fell to the ground, squirming in agony. Okay, get up, I told him. Get your ass in the house. He's been more fun to be with than I've had in years, Judy said, watching Elroy run into the house. Please, haven't you done enough? She pleaded. No, I said. Call your mom and put her on speakerphone. Lisa called her parents. Hi, mom said when she was answered. Mom, Lisa cried. It's me, Lisa. Lisa, her mother said. What's wrong? Are you hurt? Mom, Alan is kicking me out of the house, Lisa said, crying. Why is he doing that? Her mother asked. He found out I cheated on him, Lisa said through sobs. You did what? Her mother asked, clearly angry. You stupid bitch. How could you do that to your husband? I thought I raised you better than that. What the hell is wrong with you? I don't blame him for kicking you out. Mom, please can I stay with you for a while? Asked Lisa. I think so, but not for too long, said her mother. And no men. Do you understand me? Thank you, Mom, she said. Is Alan there? Her mother asked. 
I'm here, Mom, I said. I liked Lisa's parents, and I'd called them Mom and Dad since we'd gotten married. Are you okay, son? She asked. I'll be fine, Mom, I said. It won't be easy, but I'll get through it. I'm so sorry, Alan, Lisa's mother said. You were always so good to her. I don't know what went into her brain. Please stay in touch. I will, Mom, thank you, I said before she ended the conversation. I looked at Lisa before continuing. You have two more calls to make, so get on it. Please don't make me do it, she sobbed. Why not, I asked. They deserve to hear the truth. Get to it. Trembling, Lisa picked up the phone and called our son, Carl. Hi, he said, picking up the phone. Hi, Carl, Lisa said. It's Mom. Are you okay, Mom? he asked. No, she replied. Your father and I are getting a divorce. What? he asked. It can't be. What happened? Did Daddy cheat on you or something? No, son, I cheated on your daddy and he found out, Lisa said. Mom, how could you? he asked. Is Daddy there? I'm here, son, I said. Before you ask, I'm fine. I just felt you needed to hear the truth. Your mother has been doing this for over 20 years. I only found out about it today. Oh my God, Dad, he said. I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm sorry, Carl, she said. Yeah, sorry you got caught, he said. Look, Mom, I can't believe you did that to Dad. I gotta go, I'll talk to you later. Bye. He ended the conversation and Lisa sobbed as she sat on the couch. One more call, I said. Lisa looked up, her eyes red and puffy. Please, I'm begging you, she said. No more. One call, I said. Make it. Trembling, Lisa dialed our daughter's number. The call went pretty much the same as the others, only Renee was far more upset than Carl. You stupid bitch, she said when Lisa told her what was going on. I hope Daddy kicks your slimy ass to the curb. He is, Lisa said. How can you be so stupid? asked Renee. You're not my mother. Right now I don't know who you are. You better get your shit straightened out or you'll never see your grandchildren. Don't call me ever again. Goodbye. Lisa sobbed uncontrollably as Renee wrapped up the conversation. Are you beginning to realize the consequences of your actions? I asked. You completely destroyed two families with your selfishness. I hope you're happy. Lisa wiped her eyes as I spoke to her. I told you I was sorry, she said. Everyone hates me now. Well, what you sow is what you reap, I said. I think it's time for you to leave. I've already packed your toiletries and some of your things. You can make arrangements to come back later for the rest of your stuff. Nodding her head, Lisa went upstairs, picked up the suitcase and overnight bag I had placed by the bedroom door, and went back downstairs. Judy stopped her before she went out the door. Wait a second, Judy said. Did I understand your husband correctly? You've been having fun with my husband for over 20 years? Lisa bashfully lowered her eyes to the floor. Yes, she said quietly. Well, then I guess you won't mind if I steal your husband away from you, she said. After all, it's been years since I've been with a real man and your husband seems to be settling in quite nicely. Judy looked at me. What do you say? Are you ready for a little revenge? Lisa dropped the suitcase she was carrying and looked at us. You wouldn't be, would you? She asked, tears streaming down her cheeks. Please tell me you won't do this to me. I don't know, I said. Best offer I've gotten in a while. Besides, why should cheaters get all the fun? Judy laughed. I guess I have nothing to complain about, Lisa said. No, you don't, bitch, Judy said. Oh, and don't forget to take out the trash, she added, grabbing Elroy by the collar. She looked at Elroy for a moment before speaking again. Don't go in the house. I don't care where you sleep. Stay in the car or get a motel room. I never want to see you again, asshole. I'm going to see a lawyer tomorrow. Got it? He nodded his head obediently. I got it, he said, heading for the door. 
Lisa looked at me one last time. I'm sorry, Alan, she said. For everything. Goodbye. With those words, she turned away and walked out of the house and out of my life. We watched as Lisa pulled into the driveway and turned onto the main road. I felt a tear about to roll down my cheek and wiped my eyes. Judy turned to me. Are you okay? She asked. Yeah, just got something in my eye, I replied. She smiled. Bullshit, she said softly. I laughed. Tell me, how do you walk away from a 30-year marriage? I asked. By opening myself up to new possibilities, she said. I nodded my head. You really didn't know about any of this, did you? She asked. I shook my head. No, I said. I just found out today. She was doing it while I was on a business trip. What about you? Did you know what he was doing? I suspected, she said. I could smell her perfume on him and his clothes. But I never caught him doing it. I resigned myself to it and hoped he'd come to his senses. So what are you going to do now? I asked. I don't know, she replied with a sigh. I've always been a stay-at-home wife and mother. That's all I ever wanted to be. My mother raised me old-fashioned. Said the best job a woman could have was homemaker. I married right out of high school and never had a paying job. All I wanted was to make my husband happy and raise my children to be the best they could be. But I'll manage. I nodded my head. I had no doubt she'd get back on her feet. Did you really mean what you said earlier? I asked. About love and all that? She laughed. Do you want to stay the night? I asked. Would you be okay with that? She asked. I'd love the company, I said. I guess I wouldn't mind either, she said. That night we made love. Before going to bed, I inquired, why did you stay with him then? Believe it or not, I loved him, she said. Once. He was a good man at first. He always took care of me and the children. You loved your wife too, didn't you? Yes, I did, I said. Some part of me will probably always love. But I'll be damned if I'll put up with her cheating. I feel the same way, she said. As far as I'm concerned, my marriage is over. I kept my vows. But once he broke them, it was over. So now what? I asked. You mean us? She asked. I nodded my head. Yes, I said. I've never been the type to get into a one-night stand relationship, and I'm too damn old to start dating again. Is that your way of saying you like me and want to keep dating me? She asked. I guess I do, I said. Well, she began. I like you too, Alan Roberts. If it's all the same to you, I'd like to see what happens. I'd like that too, I said. She smiled. Okay, she said. The next morning? Good morning, lover, she said with a smile. Would you like some breakfast? I'd love to, I said. Okay, she said. I've already made coffee. What do you have planned for the day? I have an appointment with my lawyer this morning, and then I'm going to talk to someone about work, I said. What about you? Well, I'm going home after breakfast, and then I'll make my own appointment with the lawyer, she said. I'll see you downstairs, she added before she left. I went to the bathroom and did my morning chores and showered. I decided to wear my Class C uniform, so I got dressed, made sure everything was in order, and went downstairs. Upon seeing me, Judy's eyes went wide. Are you in the army or something? She asked. In the Marines, I replied. At least for about another month or so. I'm on terminal leave pending retirement. She looked at the ribbons and badges on my chest. What's all this for? She asked. Different things, I replied. This one, for example, says I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, more than once, I added, pointing to a purple heart ribbon with three stars on it. Oh my God, she said. You were wounded in combat? Seriously? Yes, I said. Four times. Where have you been? She asked. Desert storm in the 90s, I said. Then three tours of duty in Iraq and three more in Afghanistan. How long have you been in the military? She asked. 
Just over 30 years total, I replied. Some of that was in the reserves, but most of the time I was on active duty. So your wife cheated on you with my husband while you were in the war? She asked. And he knew what you were doing? Yes, I said. She shook her head in bewilderment. What an asshole, she said. He'll pay dearly. We ate breakfast and then headed outside. She asked me to call her after she got home, and I promised I would. The meeting with the lawyer went well. He listened to my story and went over my evidence, the prenup and the financial information I brought, showing that she was making a few thousand more than I was while on active duty. Well, I think that's pretty much out of the question, he said. Given the financial data and your prenuptial agreement, I believe we can rule out any claim for alimony, especially since she makes about $68,000 a year. She can live quite well on that money in Spokane Valley. Of course, the house and property originally belonged to you, and the prenuptial agreement clearly states that the pension will not be affected. However, you will have to split the bank account. I don't see the judge saying otherwise. We will insist on the 40% as stated in the contract. When do you want it filed? As soon as possible, I said. Good, he said. We'll have to work a little harder to get it to Washington, but that's no problem. We do it all the time. I'll handle the preparation and filing of the paperwork. If all goes well, we should be able to award it early next week. All I need from you now is the filing fee and my fee. You can pay the young lady when you leave. He held out a piece of paper to me. Here's a list of things you must do to protect yourself, he added. I hope your wife hasn't gotten to the bank yet. I looked over the list. I would definitely have to stop by the bank on my way out of the house. Most of the rest could be done online. Any questions? He asked. I shook my head. Not at the moment, I said. He handed me a card and shook my hand. Feel free to call if you need anything, he said. And good luck. I stopped at the exit, paid the filing fee and prepayment, and hit the road. Once in the car, I called John. Just finished with the lawyer, I told him. I need to stop by the bank to settle things there, but I wanted to talk to you about that job you were talking about. I'll be here, Gunny, he said. I look forward to seeing you. After the conversation ended, he sent me a text message with directions to the campground. I went to the bank and found that Lisa hadn't touched the account yet, so I withdrew 60% and used it to open a new account in my name only. I then canceled the joint credit cards, paying off the balance. I also ordered a new ATM card and a new credit card for myself. After that, I traveled to the campground, which was about 35 miles northeast of my home. Unfortunately, the drive was a little longer, but it was a good day, and it gave me a chance to reflect on my life. In just one day, I went from a happily married man anticipating retirement and old age with his wife to a man learning that I had been made a fool of and cuckolded for over 20 years. Six of those years I was in a war zone, literally putting my life on the line. I realized that emotionally I dealt with Lisa's betrayal the same way I dealt with armed fanatics and terrorists wanting to kill me in combat. At least there was Judy. I don't know how I would have handled it all alone. I certainly liked her vigor and candor. And she was damn good in bed. I just hoped I wasn't making a mistake by getting involved with her so soon after I dumped Lisa. Finally, I pulled onto the road leading to Camp Rollins. There was no traffic on the narrow two-lane road, so I was going pretty fast. I pulled up to a gate with a small guard booth and stopped. An armed man in a camouflage uniform came to my window. I'm here to see John Sykes, I said. The name's Roberts. Alan Roberts. I handed him John's card and my driver's license as I was commanded. One moment, sir, the guard said. He inspected my truck and went back to the shack. I watched him talk to someone on a field phone. After a minute or two, he returned to my truck and handed me back my license and business card. Commandant Sykes is expecting you. Welcome to Camp Rollins, Gunny Roberts, the man said. I started to thank him, but he had already left to open the gate. He waved at me as I drove by and I waved back. After driving around a few more tight turns, I found myself in the grounds of a typical military camp. Wooden buildings were neatly arranged around a central area where groups of men marched or ran around. Everything was spotlessly clean and the grounds were neatly manicured. I found the camp headquarters and parked in front of it. 
I stepped inside and was greeted by an attractive blonde woman in a professional skirt. She looked up and smiled as I entered the office. You must be Sergeant Roberts, she said. Yes, I replied. Welcome to Camp Rollins, she said. Commandant Sykes is expecting you. Would you like a cup of coffee? Yes, please. That sounds great, I said. Black, if that's okay. Sure, she said. Please come in. I knocked on the door and he, on the phone, invited me inside. I noticed he was wearing a khaki-colored uniform shirt with a set of silver oak leaves denoting the rank he held in the army. He hung up the phone and stood up to greet me. Glad you could make it, Gunny, he said. Please have a seat. I sat down just as the receptionist brought me my coffee. I thanked her and took a sip. It was just what the doctor ordered. I take it you had no trouble getting here. None. You gave excellent directions, I said. Good, he said. Before we get too deep into things, let me tell you a little more about the people who come here. Every man who comes through these gates is a victim. All of them have been cheated on, and many of them have been abused in one form or another. Sometimes that abuse is physical in nature. Almost every man who comes through here has been emotionally abused. Other times they have been both physically and emotionally abused. And that's in addition to cuckolding and humiliation. I could relate to that. He continued. On top of that, these men are what you might call wimps. I know we're not supposed to use terms like that these days, but I believe in having an honest conversation, he said. Most of the men who come here are weak both physically and emotionally. Some of them are also scared and feel like they have no one else to turn to for help. Unfortunately, the women they choose to attach themselves to take advantage of that. Wow, I said, shocked by what he was telling me. So what do you do? The first thing we do is force them to focus and strengthen them physically, John said. We deny them access to the internet and don't allow them to use any electronics, cell phones, laptops, tablets, whatever. For the three months they are here, there is no internet. That means no email, no Facebook, no YouTube, nothing. I laughed. I bet that will be well received, I said sarcastically. He laughed. Sometimes, he said. Before they got here, some of these guys spent all day looking at their cell phones, completely oblivious to the world around them. We take that opportunity away from them and force them to face their problems. So how do they keep in touch with their families? I asked. Asked me. That's a valid question, John said. We give them a mailbox address that they can send home. Any communication is done through regular mail. We have post offices in Bonners Ferry and Clark Fork, and mail is delivered twice a week. It's a long way to get to the post office, I said. John nodded his head. We don't want spouses sending people to cause trouble, he said. We have armed guards, helicopters, and an electronic security perimeter around the camp. If anyone tries to get inside, we'll know about it. Has anyone ever tried to get in? I asked. There have been attempts, John said. Fortunately, we were able to neutralize the threat. There's an unclassified briefing on that in the packet I'm sending home to you. Neutralize, I thought to myself. An interesting term, to say the least. I couldn't help but wonder what he meant by it. So tell me more about the training itself, I said. I'll give you a brief overview. Everything is described in the packet I'll send you home. The first month is the most difficult for the students, John explained. In addition to being weaned off modern electronics and the internet, they undergo rigorous physical training very similar to the first phase of recruit training. Their day starts at 0500 with a curtsy, they double pace everywhere, and the instructors are pretty strict if you know what I mean. In the second month, we introduce students to their counselors, John says. They go through a very intensive counseling session to sort out their problems. Of course, the physical training continues, and we start teaching them self-defense. In the third month, we reinforce all of that and introduce them to lawyers so they can deal with any legal issues they have. He glanced at his watch before continuing. As a matter of fact, there's a group class going on right now. You might be interested in it, he said. Sure, I said. We walked out of his office and went to another building. Opening the door, he motioned for me to go in first. When I stepped inside, I saw a group of men sitting in a semicircle in front of a female counselor. 
The instructor sitting by the door froze as John entered, then nodded to me and sat back down. We took our seats at the back of the room and watched in silence. One of the students recalled how his wife made him service her lovers, both orally and annally, while she laughed and belittled his manhood. He burst into tears, and the students on either side of him patted him on the shoulder, assuring him that everything would be okay. I looked at the instructor, a large man with sergeant's chevrons on his collar. He sat stoically taking in everything that was happening. I could see his jaw clenching with anger as the student cried. While the counselor was talking to the student, I made the decision to join this organization. If there was anything I could do to help these poor people, I would do it. After listening to some more counseling, John invited me in and we left. He walked me around the camp, showing me what they had to offer. From there, we went to the instructor's hut, the building where the instructors gathered to keep up with the latest news. There were several men there dressed in the same khaki-colored shirts as John. Some wore sergeant's chevrons and a few wore the insignia of a staff sergeant. John had them gather in the main part of the hut and introduced me to them. We talked for a while and I learned that about half of them were former Marine Corps drill instructors and half were former Army NCOs. From the conversation, I realized that these people are a tight-knit group and they really care about the well-being of their students. So, do you want to join the team? One of them asked me. I looked at John before answering. As a matter of fact, yes, I said. John smiled before he spoke. I've asked John to be our new senior instructor, John said. He's on terminal leave right now, so it'll be a while before he's working here full time. In the meantime, I'd like him to spend some time here, getting to know everyone. The others nodded their heads approvingly. Welcome aboard, Gunny, one of them said, shaking my hand. The others followed suit. Thank you, I said. After that, John and I went back to his office, talking about work and what was being done at the camp. So, John said, are you in? I nodded my head. Yes, John, I said. He smiled and shook my hand. Welcome aboard, he said. If you don't mind me asking, why did you decide to join us? Listening to that man in counseling, I said. I never knew this sort of thing actually happened. I thought they just read about it on the internet. Yeah, John said. It's a lot more common than people realize. By the way, I suppose I should make you an official proposal, he said laughing. He handed me a piece of paper, and I nearly fell over when I saw what the company was offering a salary far in excess of what I was getting in the Corps and a benefits package to die for. Of course, I accepted the offer. Okay, John said, handing me a stack of folders. A little light reading to get you through the next few weeks. I laughed. Feel free to come back anytime you want. You'll definitely want to come to the bitch-burning ceremony. What? I asked. It's something we do at the end of every class, he said. I think you'll enjoy it. Saying goodbye, I picked up my folders and headed home. The next three weeks flew by quickly. Lisa received the divorce papers and immediately signed them without contesting anything. The attorney called me and told me my divorce would be final in 30 days. Judy filed for divorce from Elroy, but her divorce would take longer, at least 90 days, because she filed in her home state of Washington. I never heard from Lisa again, nor was I interested. Her parents arrived about two weeks after I filed for divorce and took the few things she wanted out of the house, along with the rest of her belongings. I gave them the cashier's check for her portion of the bank accounts, as well as all of our pictures of her. I didn't want anything in the house to remind me of her. According to Lisa's mother, she was too embarrassed to make eye contact with me. Somehow I wasn't surprised. However, Judy spent the last three weekends at my place and we had a great time. I took her fishing on Lake Pendo Rail, and she had a lot of fun. Lisa was never a fan of this activity, but Judy took to it with gusto, eagerly cleaning and cooking the kokanee salmon we caught. I made it a habit to visit the camp a couple times a week and talk to each of the instructors. I learned that they are all combat veterans and divorced, although a couple of them are starting new relationships. I also attended several group counseling sessions to understand what motivated the students to come here in the first place. I must admit that their stories touched my heart. I also learned what caused the camp to be so tightly guarded. As I was able to find out, one of the students was a victim of an organization called MAs. He ran away from his wife and came to the camp, but the organization was determined to bring him back. They even attempted an armed invasion of the camp, 
but that attempt was foiled thanks to the camp guards and a federal agency I had never heard of before. As a result, the company has established new rules that if MMAS is mentioned by a prospective student, that agency must be contacted. From what I read, the agency had been called twice in the last year. Toward the end of the month, John invited me to witness the burning of the bitch ceremony that marked the end of the three-month course. I put on my Class C uniform and hit the road. The ceremony was held at night and I, along with John, stood back and watched. While I watched, the students in the class were attaching pictures of their wives to a straw figure, which was then lifted up and attached to a pole with a rope. At the base of the pole was a pile of firewood. One of the students was called up and handed a lighted torch. Burn the bow, the teacher commanded. Sir, burn the bow. Aye, aye, sir, replied the student. He set a pile of wood on fire, and the fire quickly engulfed the straw figure. The students began chanting, Burn, burn, burn! As the figure burned, the students raged, raising their fists in the air, howling and chanting. When the figure fell to the ground, the students danced and chanted, and some urinated on the figure. This went on for a while until the figure turned to ashes. What is all this for? I asked John. Asked John. This little ceremony gives the men a sense of completion, he explained. It's a way to purge themselves of whatever has been tormenting them without resorting to violence against their spouses. Tomorrow they'll graduate from here ready to deal with whatever life may throw at them. Just think, three months ago they came here as weak cuckolds. Tomorrow they'll leave here as men. I could understand that. For a moment I imagined it was Lisa who was tied up and burning into ashes. The thought made me smile to myself. How are things going on the home front? asked John. Good, I replied. The divorce will be final in a few days. How are you holding up? he asked. I nodded my head. I'm doing fine, I said. A lot better than I thought. That's good to hear, he told me. I understand your vacation ends in a few days. Yes, I said. Three days to be exact. Excellent, he said. Then I expect you to be ready to meet our new students. They'll be here in four days. By the way, you'll need this, he added, reaching into his pocket. He handed me a small box. Opening it, I found a set of polished metal chevrons. Sergeant Major? I asked. Yes, he replied. This denotes your status as a senior instructor. Congratulations. Thank you, I said. He smiled. No, he said. Thank you. I spent the next four days with Judy. Elroy offered to buy out her half of the house, and she accepted. Apparently, he was planning to move Lisa in with him, and she was anxious to get out of the place. I suggested she move in with me, and she readily agreed, so I rented a trailer, moved everything she wanted out of their old house, and moved her in with me. It would be tight for a while, but I knew we could get things under control. Judy watched me dress for my first full day at camp and then fed me a breakfast befitting a king. She handed me a thermos of coffee and kissed me as I walked out the door. Follow them, she said with a smile. I will. I didn't know where a relationship with Judy would lead, but I was willing to give it a try. So far, she had managed to fill the void left by Lisa, and I couldn't remember when I had been so content. I made my way to the campground and headed to the reception area. I examined myself in the mirror, adjusted my hiking pouch over my eyes, and stepped out onto the porch overlooking the group of men on the trail. Oh my god! God! I screamed, looking around at the small group of men standing in the parking lot. How the hell do they expect me to make men when they don't even send me human beings to begin with? Get this sorry bunch out of my sight and get to processing them before I start swearing. Yes, Sergeant, the man replied, and escorted the group to processing. As they left, I turned around and saw John. He was grinning from ear to ear. Well done, he said. Welcome to Camp Rollins. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.